Well, we're going to start a new series today on the book of James, the letter of James. It's a very short letter, but it is a, a very powerful series. Um, you know, I was thinking about, as I was preparing, how I used to write so many more letters than I do now. Um, I still write letters as part of what a pastor does from time to time. Usually it's an official letter of some sort. But I started writing letters actually when I was in high school. Um, Kelly and I started dating while we were going to Southwest High School. And so we wrote letters to each other all the time. We didn't call them letters. We called them notes. We passed notes in school. We'd write them out by hand and fold them up in these little cool little ways you fold them up so they'll stay all compacted together. Uh, if there's anybody here who grew up in the 70s or 80s or 90s, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and we'd pass, pass those things back and forth to each other. And then, and when I graduated, I, I went to Marietta, moved to Marietta. Kelly was still in Macon, so we had a long-distance relationship. Now, this was back when you had to pay to make long-distance calls. It's quite expensive and much more expensive than we could afford at the time. So we would make one phone call a week because I didn't see her all week. I'd come home on the weekends, but I had to go all the time in between without her. Make one phone call a week, very short phone call, and we'd write one letter a week. I'd write a letter, mail it to her, and she would mail one to me usually. And we still have those letters packed away in a box somewhere in the closet of all the little notes that we wrote and all the little letters that we wrote. But letter writing used to be something I think people did a lot more than they do now. But um, we sort of still take it for granted. There's other ways to communicate with email and text messages and things like that now. But James wrote a very powerful letter. It's packed full of practical advice on how to live as a Christian in a world that's often unchristian. And so we're going to study our way through that. We're going to take it slow because there's a lot of good stuff in there that we don't want to miss. But today, I just want to read the very first verse of his letter, James 1, verse 1. This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. So, there are many letters in the New Testament. It makes up a good portion of what we read. Most of the letters, um, we don't realize that what a new technology this was. You do think of a letter as being technology, but you don't. It seems old, and, and as I said, it's starting to pass from common practice in our modern 21st century world. But actually, in New Testament times, writing letters was a, a relatively new thing. Now, don't get me wrong. People had been writing and sending letters for centuries before the New Testament. But what was new about it was that in the past, it had usually been only done by royal officials. Writing was not something that most people could do. And writing material was very expensive and hard to come by for the average common person who might not even know how to read or write anyway. So by the time of the New Testament, and, and here's the other thing, how would you get your letter from one place to another? Who was going to take it? And how would it get there? Well, by the time of the New Testament, all of the different technologies of the world had come to, in, to alignment so that the average ordinary person could send a letter to the other side of the world. Because now that all of a sudden, paper and writing materials were much less expensive, and so it was still expensive, but ordinary people could get it. And the Roman Empire had set up roads and transportation so that you could get a letter from one place to another. And right about that time, it's almost like God knew what was happening, and Christ came into the world, and his whole story came to be, and it was written down, and people started writing letters, Christians started writing letters and spreading the good news all over the world, which was something that they couldn't have done just a few hundred years before that. So this was a new technology, and the church was using it. Now, that's kind of a surprising thing, because the church tends to be a very traditional, conservative thing. We're not usually the quickest to adopt new technology. Um, but the early Christians adopted it. 
Now, they were writing letters, and you might have learned in school the structure of a letter. Most letters have a sort of a form that you follow. You know, there's a greeting. Um, you, you, you start the heading out, and you, maybe you put the date on there. If it's a formal letter, you might put the address. And then you have a salutation, right? You say, dear so-and-so, or dear Kelly, your eyes are as beautiful as a, a, you know, a babbling brook, <laughs> or something like that. That's not very good. I should try again, shouldn't I? I tr- I trust me, my letters were probably much worse than that in high school. <laughs> but you have a salutation, and then you have a body where you cover the main topics of the letter, and then you have the closing, your dearest, most wonderful boyfriend, or whatever you write. And most of the letters in the New Testament follow a similar pattern, but most of them are written by a man named Paul, the Apostle. He, he was a very prolific writer, and all of his letters were, uh, most of all of his letters were retained and put in the New Testament. But then there is this letter that we're studying by a man named James. Now, who is James? In the letter, he says, I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A slave. Now, what is a slave? You know what a slave is. But maybe it was different in the ancient world. In the first century in Israel, a slave was typically considered property of it, the slave's owner, lacking any freedom or autonomy. People entered slavery for a variety of different reasons. Maybe it was because they, they owed a debt that they could not pay. And so they would say, here, I can't pay you back for this loan but I will be your slave. Or maybe they were so poor, they had no means to take care of themselves, and the choice was either die of starvation or to go and let become someone's slave. And you would voluntarily enter into slavery. It also could be a result of a crime that you had committed. And the punishment, maybe you had stolen something or done something terrible to someone, and then the, the penalty would be that you would become their slave. Another possibility might be that you lived in a nation that was conquered by a more powerful nation. And then everyone in, or whoever lived and survived that war became a slave. And they no longer had any rights. They had to do whatever the, their master told them to do. There were some legal protections under various different laws for how you could treat a slave. But they were still fundamentally bound to serve their master. And if their master followed the rules, followed the laws, they might have a decent existence. But you can imagine when the, the master has all the power and the slave has none, then oftentimes slaves were greatly abused. We don't like the word slave in the 21st century. Some Bible translations Because they don't like that word, they even try to sanitize it from the New Testament. They will change it to the word servant. But that doesn't really cover it. I mean, servant is such a more friendly term. I mean, you could, in a sense, you could go out to eat lunch after church today, and you could say, you know, my waiter or my waitress is my servant for the time that I'm there. They're serving me. They're bringing me, making sure I have the food I need, taking care of all of my needs. They're serving. They're a servant. That sounds a lot better than they're my slave, right? That just doesn't sound good. But the Greek word the New Testament uses is doulos, and it literally means bond servant, which is a person who sold themselves into slavery in order to repay a debt that they had no means of repaying. Slavery is a dirty word to our ears for many reasons. People were never meant to be owned by another person. It creates a serious imbalance of power, and human masters cannot be trusted to hold so much power over another human being, even if that person willingly submits to being a slave. I mean, think about it. Even in the 21st century, In our modern enlightened time, people sometimes cannot be trusted to take care of a dog or a cat. How many times have you heard of the neglect of people neglecting an animal 
let alone another human being. Perhaps that's why it's so scary, so frightening, so incredibly awesome, the rights and privileges that we have as parents, that we have, for practical purposes, almost ultimate power over another human being that we call a child. For a couple of decades, that child must obey us. They must do what we, we, we tell them to do. Their well-being is tied to how we treat them. And yes, there are protections in you know, the legal codes and all of that kind of thing, but parents sometimes abuse those things and sometimes are never found out for it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible thing when you think about it. And, and we give that responsibility. I got that responsibility when I was like 23. I was not prepared <laughs> for that job, but I did the best that I could. And I'm so thankful to have had the help and support of a church to help me to do that and the grace of God as well. James identifies, he self-identifies as a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And based on scripture, God is a good and worthy master. He always seeks the good of his slaves. He doesn't treat people like slaves. In fact, Jesus, who is God, said in John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves. I call you friends. But James calls himself a slave. Who is this James? Do we know anything about him? We actually do. And it's quite fascinating. The Bible says Jesus had brothers and sisters. Did you know that? Jesus had a family. We knew he had Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his father. But he also had brothers and sisters. Matthew 13, 55 says his four brothers were named James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. James, that wrote this letter, was a brother of Jesus. And James is always listed first, which typically means that he was the oldest of Jesus' younger brothers. After Jesus was crucified... James would have been the eldest of the living brothers of Christ, responsible now for being the head of the household. Because Joseph had already died, so now he was the oldest living male relative in the family. And all the responsibilities of the family now fell upon him. And this is the James who wrote this letter that we're reading. Now think about it. As far as we know, Jesus never wrote anything down or else it's been lost to history. So the closest thing we have is this letter of, from Jesus' brother, James. So we ought to pay attention. Kind of, kind of uh, humorously, have you ever thought about what it was like to be a brother of Jesus? I mean, have you ever been compared to your siblings and been a little jealous? Can you imagine? Mary, you know, James has gotten in trouble for doing something stupid again. And uh, Mary's like, why can't you be more like Jesus? And Jesus is like, oh, James, oh, uh, Jesus, James is like, oh, Jesus, he's perfect. I bet you think he walks on water. James and his brothers actually did not believe in Jesus at first. That's what we learned from Scripture. Not at first. I guess maybe it was hard for them to think of Jesus in that way. Having grown up in the household with him, known um, all about him, seen everything about him, they didn't believe that he was the Son of God. They didn't believe that what he was saying, that he was going to die and rise come back to life, that he was the Messiah, the chosen one. In Mark chapter 3, verse 20, it's, it says that Jesus' brothers thought he was out of his mind. He was teaching one day, and all of these teachings, the stirring up of trouble, they were so concerned about him that they came with Mary and tried to take him away. They wanted to get him, get, him, get him out of public eye. He's causing too much trouble. 
and they didn't really believe what he was saying. He's getting out of hand. You know, teaching a nice Sunday school lesson every now and then is fine. You start talking about being the son of God who's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You, you know, you might need a little help, Jesus. And we love you. We're your family. We're going to come take you in hand. But at some point, probably after Jesus died and actually did rise from the grave and people saw him, James became a believer. And he became a great leader in the early church. Now you might think that James would trumpet his status as Jesus' brother. Listen to me. Follow me. I'm Jesus' brother. I've known him my whole life. I knew him when he was a, a little kid. But James doesn't do any of that. Instead, he humbles himself and he says, What? I am a slave of God and of Jesus Christ, the Lord. He says, I'm my brother's slave. He's okay with that. That's all he cares to be known as. Now, letters are written from someone to someone. So who is the letter of James written to? He says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Now, what does that mean? Well, the 12 tribes was sort of an end-tide term amongst Jewish believers. From their history, you might know that there were 12 tribes of, of, of uh, Israel. And they quite often were scattered abroad by persecutions, by being conquered by foreign powers that were more powerful than them. They were taken off into exile. There were actually no longer 12 tribes of Israel. There were only two. Ten of them had been completely lost because they'd been taken away and scattered into oblivion and no longer came back together. Nobody knew where they were. To this day, they don't know what happened to those people. Only the, the Jews and the half-tribe from the southern kingdom of Judah, which is where you get the name Jew, are Jewish. So he's writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Now at this stage in Christian history, almost all Christians were Jewish people who believed that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. Sometimes scholars will point out that James was a, was a Jewish person writing to Jewish Christians, not Gentile Christians. But I thought about that this week and I said, you know what? If you, you know, if you've been studying the Bible, you've probably heard that. But what, what does that really say? It doesn't really tell us anything. Because all Christians, I mean, all, I mean, yes, there were a few Gentiles who became Christians. But at this point, almost all Christians were Jewish people that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So it's not really intended for one type of Christian over another. But the real point of what James is saying is that he's writing to believers who are scattered abroad. And that is literally what was happening. Because the Jewish people who believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, there were a lot of other Jewish people who didn't believe it. And they said, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That's blasphemy. And they kicked him out of their churches. They called them synagogues, not churches, but they kicked them out. They said, you don't believe right. You're not following our teachings. You can't be a part of our family, our church anymore. They kick them out. And not only did they kick them out of the church, but they basically sort of ostracized them in the community. They said, you know what? We don't believe like you. You're not part of us anymore. We're not going to buy our products from you anymore. We're going to go somewhere else. So not only did they lose their church family, they lost their businesses. Some of them were chased out of their homes, chased out of their towns. They literally had been scattered, had to leave town in order to get away from the persecution that they were facing. They were scattered and they were fleeing from persecution. And as they scattered, they went from town to town and it was terrible what was happening to them, but God did not waste their suffering 
Because everywhere they went, they faithfully told people about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God who had risen from the grave. And Christianity began to spread all over the world. Wherever they went, they were telling people. But being scattered in such a manner is tough. It hurts. It's hard. And you might feel really lonely in a situation like that. Can you imagine if you had to leave your home and your church family and your friends and you had to move away from everything you've ever known and loved your whole life? Make you feel really lonely. And that's one of the reasons that James is writing this letter. To encourage Christians who feel lost and lonely in a world that doesn't have their same values. They're trying to live for God in a world that doesn't care and actually thinks that they're crazy. And he's saying, you're not crazy. And you're not alone. Hang in there. Do you ever feel like you don't belong in a world where people seem so mean and angry and unloving and judgmental and immoral? I know I do sometimes. The world around me right now in America, sometimes in many ways is becoming a foreign place. Sometimes it feels like common sense and common decency have been flipped upside down. And yet we're called to live here and to love people and to carry on. But I know that there are others around the world that have it even worse. I got a text message from a, from a friend of mine in Pakistan this morning who lives in a place where 95% of the population is not Christian, but a very militant form of, an, of, uh, uh, of the Muslim religion. And they literally think he's crazy, think that he's blaspheming by calling Jesus the Son of God. And Christians in that country um, are often discriminated against, um, arrested, uh, even killed. And they, they have to live in that world. So there are a lot of Christians scattered amongst the world today who feel lost and alone and scattered. And James writes a letter to help us when we feel like we are a remnant, a scattered remnant of faithful people living in this broken world. James is a letter written to encourage you to be faithful and not give up. But James is more than just cliches and platitudes. James is real talk. In five short chapters, James shares powerful, practical wisdom about how to live as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ in a hostile world. Whereas other writers, sometimes in the New Testament, uh, would focus on philosophy and theology, James gets down to brass tacks and focuses on how Christians live out faith in actions, not just beliefs. And every paragraph in James is important. So we're going to take it one at a time and work our way through it lesson by lesson. And I hope that you'll come each week. I hope that you will pay close attention. And I challenge you to go deeper in your faith, in your walk with Jesus, deeper than just what you believe. Jesus or James will teach you to live out your Christian faith by what you do. Day to day. James was Jesus' brother. But anyone who gives their life to Christ and becomes a Christian is a brother or sister of Christ. And we're not alone. We are part of a royal family. Family of God. If you are a Christian, you are my brother or my sister. You are not alone. We're in this together. Baptism is the sacred ceremony Christians use to initiate people into this family of God. The Jews of the Old Testament circumcised their babies on the, when they were eight days old. Christians are baptized. 
Men, aren't you glad that we are baptized, not circumcised? But baptism is a sacrament that Jesus told us to practice, that God uses to pour out his grace upon us. No one deserves God's grace, but God gives it freely to all who repent and seek his help. When we baptize an infant, we see just how glorious God's grace is. The parents and the family of the child come to us and we seek God's grace to help the parents raise the child so that it will always know God's love and hopefully one day that child will make its own choice to follow Christ. Today we have the privilege of baptizing Ivy Rose McCamey. Do you call her Ivy or Ivy Rose? Just Ivy. It's a beautiful name. I just like saying Ivy Rose. I probably will say it because every time I say it in my head, that's how I say it. Even though Ivy doesn't know what's happening, God knows her and is pouring his divine help over her, helping her to grow in wisdom and strength that one day she will come to know the most important thing she can ever know, that God is love. And Jesus died for her so that she can have everlasting life. And so we will baptize Ivy Rose as a means of seeking God's grace for Ivy, for her parents, and for all of us. So that we can be the Christian family that she and her parents need in order to give them every chance possible to succeed. The baptism that we begin today will be completed on the day that she chooses to confirm her faith in Christ for herself. But today is a day of beginnings. So we will begin by baptizing Ivy. I want to invite Eden and Riley to come and their family to come and stand with them. And anybody else that would like to come and stand and support this family, we stand right down here. As we baptize Ivy, we'll ask Eden and Riley, if they would confirm, reconfirm their faith in Jesus Christ and um, make some promises, but we're going to ask the whole congregation to make some promises as well, okay? All right. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and reject the evil powers of the world? If you do, say, I do. Do you repent of your sins, turn to Jesus Christ and confess him as your Lord and Savior? If you do, say, I do. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament? Do you say, I do. Do you accept the responsibility to resist evil, injustice, and oppression by the grace and power of God? If you do say, I do. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in them all the days of your life by the grace and power of God? If you will say, I will. Congregation. Will you nurture Ivy and her family and Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, they may all be guided to accept God's grace for themselves and profess their faith openly and lead a Christian life? If you will, say we will. Will you who witness these vows encourage this family in the faith and do all in your power to support them? in their life of Christ. If you will, say, we will. We will. Right. Let us pray. Father God, I pray for you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here. Pour out your Spirit upon this holy water that it may be a sign for us of your grace, your cleansing power, your Holy Spirit that fills us and, and pours grace into our lives that we do not have to work by our own power Your power springs up like a well within us. We pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ivy Rose McCamey, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father God, pour out your grace upon Ivy, that she may have all of the help that she needs to grow up in the faith, knowing your love and becoming a child 
who confesses her faith in you openly when she is ready. Pour out your grace upon her family. They would help her in that process. And pour out your grace upon us that we would support the family in this process. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. All right, little Ivy, Ivy Rose, we're going to take you on a little trip, let you see your family. All right, I think we've got a song we're going to sing.